Transmission start. Welcome to Where Did the Road Go? Join us as we wander off the path and explore lost history, consciousness, the paranormal, unexplained mysteries, alternative thought, and much more. We are present on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com. Now here is your host, Soraya. So, I am here with Joshua Kutchin, the returning red pill junkie. And for the first time, Lobo from Project Archivist. Hi. <laughs> and we've had Rojan on a couple of times, but you wouldn't have. This is the first time you've been able to join us, Lobo. It is. I'm so, honored. And we're happy to have you here. That'll change. <laughs> <laughs> and Red Pill, how are you doing? We haven't heard from you in three, four weeks now, maybe? Yeah, I know. Yeah, you know. I mean, say what you will about Mr. Trump, but you know, laying bricks on the wall is good cardio. <laughs> wow, <laughs> that's great. All right, and so that's great, Joshua. I'm going to let you start this off because the first thing you wanted to talk about was uh, was was yours. So, go for it. Yeah. Well, absolutely. So, um, as everyone knows, I am uh, something of a Sasquatch uh, enthusiast. I think I'm probably the most Sasquatch savvy person in the regular roundtables in terms of <laughs> in terms of how much I, I I look into Sasquatch. And as as you know, as part of that. I've been following a couple of different podcasts, and uh, I'm taking this moment to sort of acknowledge what I see as a positive development uh, in one of the more popular Sasquatch podcasts, and to sort of clear the clear the air about some things that I've I've said. Um, so uh, there is a popular uh, Sasquatch podcast that I've actually recommended to people um, called Sasquatch Chronicles, and I've uh, been listening to it for I think about two and a half years now, probably. Um, I think. Uh, I, I, I enjoy the podcast quite a bit. Um, early on, I was a little bit turned off by um, some of the attitudes that were expressed towards some witnesses. Um, it took a hard materialist stance um, toward the the Sasquatch problem, as it were. Um, and uh, to the point that people who reported odd 14 things in their sightings were labeled flute players. And so this turned me off from the podcast a little bit. I still listen because regardless of anything regarding the hosts, the uh, the guests that they had on were still witnesses. And I think that, you know, you can separate the hosts from what, you know, the, the, the guests calling in have to say. <clears throat> um, but uh, and so actually so having that in my in my, you know, being aware of that sort of stance of the show, even though I still listened, I was um a little bit critical of the show, um, not only in person, but also um, on the air. I would say some things like, there's a podcast that says X, Y, Z. Because honestly, I think it's disingenuous to say that because someone saw an eight-foot-tall ape walk across the road that looked like a flesh-and-blood creature. Well, that account is okay, but this other person who saw that eight-foot-tall creature in the woods you know, uh, disappear in front of their eyes and have glowing red eyes. They're, well, they're the crazy ones. <clears throat> I think that's a, that's, that's a bit disingenuous. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so I was, I was sort of critical of the program for a while and uh, I'm sure some people probably put two and two together about what program I was talking about. But the reason that I sort of want to bring this up is to, 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 to publicly say that I'm, I'm very pleased with the direction that, uh, that particular show has, has taken and, uh, kudos to you, uh, Wes, the host, if you're listening, um, he recently posted a behind the scenes uh, podcast entry where he uh, told a very compelling story of these two brothers who um, who were on some property and actually had a medium come in. So the two brothers had actually called into the show and talked about how they've had these you know Sasquatch running around. They were trying to shoot them and they were wanting to shoot them because they were causing a bunch of trouble. They were completely convinced that it was a large ape. <clears throat> and these two brothers invited um, a medium onto their property. I'm not really sure why, but the entire narrative of their experience turned and that in turn helped the host sort of come to grips with some of these otter, um, more Fortean encounters. Hmm. So on this most recent entry, which is a great episode of the show, um, they sort of came around to what I've, the, the, they, they came around to start banging on the drum that I've been banging on for a while, which is, it seems to me as if the Sasquatch question has a lot of different answers. And I don't think any one group of people really is, is 
cor- is entirely correct, but I don't think any one group of people is really wrong. Um, the idea that they threw out was that there are possibly flesh and blood Sasquatch that can be subject to demonic possession of some sort, which is kind of a variation on what I've sort of been proposing as well about, you know, there being a, a flesh and blood creature that sometimes has its imagery co-opted by something else, a lot like Mike Cleland in his, in, in his research with the owls. Um, but, you know, I just want to take this moment in case anybody's heard me say that and, like, and, and you know, I've had some private conversations with people um, to say that, I, you know, I, I really admire it whenever people adapt in their views and when they become more understanding and when they become more open to things like this. Um, I think that uh, a change of heart like that uh, deserves to be called out. And I think that moving forward um, in all, you know, of these sort of 14 areas, that's probably a good place to start is with this idea of, well, it's a little bit of this and it's a little bit of that. You know, similarly, um, I don't think any any one person has the UFO answer. I think a lot of people are right about it to some degree. I think it's partially misidentification. It's partially unorthodox aircraft. It's partially extraterrestrials, maybe. That's probably the thing I'm least least uh, comfortable saying. Uh, it's probably partially uh, psi effects. It's probably partially you know interdimensional. It, I think it's I think it's a multifaceted answer, and I just applaud people when they can accept when they can accept something like that and move beyond the false dichotomy which is set up in a lot of these fields. And I just want to take a moment to say that I don't know if we can sort of build a conversation off of that, but uh, that was sort of those were sort of my feelings. All right. Well, what, what what are your guys' feelings on the whole paranormal Sasquatch type of thing? Lobo? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I uh, Paranormal Sasquatch, I don't really have a dog in the fight in that manner. Um, I can't say whether or not... I, I can't discredit anybody as far as what they've seen. I wasn't there. I don't know what they've seen or what they claim to have seen. Uh, I do know that I believe that there may be the possibility of a uh, bipedal hominid wandering around in remote areas of North America and many other places on the planet. But uh, as far as a por- paranormal, I I don't I don't know. I can't say. <laughs> I, I I have a real hard time with the whole demonic spin on things yeah and and you know i i I can i definitely empathize and sympathize with that i guess i guess what my my real um my the real point that i was hoping to emphasize is i i appreciate the fact when people who are in fringe subjects don't automatically write off other people's takes if, oh, they yeah, seem, absolutely. if they if they seem genuine i mean obviously if somebody's a deliberate huckster or somebody's telling a story that's absolutely bat nut insane well you know that's different but uh yeah but yeah I no mean, I, I i think you i think yeah i i totally understand what you're saying too i won't i won't ever discredit anybody for what they've i what they've seen i've seen some pretty whacked out stuff in my time i can't explain a lot of it uh some of it i can just barely explain only by just sheer definition of what other people have reported but I will not come out and tell someone, no, nope, you didn't see that. You don't know what you're talking about. Because, again, I wasn't there. Yeah. And for me to do something like that, not only am I doing a disservice to the person that's trying to relay the information to me, I'm also doing a disservice to myself by not allowing myself to remain open. Right. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And Miguel? Hi. hi. Well... You gentlemen obviously are aware of the uh, metaphor, the scientific metaphor of the Schrodinger cat. Schrodinger cat. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that absolutely. Is either, it, it's either alive or dead, and you don't find out until you finally get it out of the box. So to me, you know, I've come to realize that to me, Sasquatch is my Schrodinger uh, cryptid, you know? To me, it's either, <laughs> you know, a flesh and bo- blood uh, creature or a paranormal entity, and we don't, won't know until we get it out of the forest, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. I, I, I always, I, I've come to the point where I feel like there's probably reason to accept a flesh and blood Sasquatch. It seems like it's probably very rare, but it's likely out there. 
On the other hand, it could be because it's in that liminal, we don't know if it really exists state, that that sort of trickster element of our reality kind of kicks in and then starts emulating the things that we see. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's a that's a really good way to put it too. It, uh, but for both of you, um, you know, that's what I liked about this particular entry that they had is that and I recommend anybody listening to this particular um, this particular entry in their in their show because it's it's a pretty fascinating account of these guys that these two brothers um, related. Um, but yeah, I, I think I don't think that we should. I don't think that we should. Um, Right off the possibility of a flesh and blood Sasquatch, because there are plenty of encounters where Sasquatch sightings do have an encounter that um, is very much like you would expect to, you know, encounter an ape. And there are certain physiological things that co- correspond highly to ape physiology, you know. But at the same time, you have these odd, you know, you have disappearing Sasquatch, you have Sasquatch with glowing red eyes, you have um, Sasquatch who supposedly are telepathic. You have the Oz effect, which we normally associate with UFOs, um, sometimes, you know, in conjunction with Sasquatch sightings. And to me, it's just one of those things where uh, it's it's a little bit too coincidental um, to have all these things happening, in addition to the fact that they seem to be so damn hard to find. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it's interesting because the moment we say, you know, flesh and blood animal. I mean, what are we trying to convey here? The idea that they are just, you know, regular, you know, boring, you know, limited creatures. I mean, we humans are also flesh and blood. But does that mean that we humans are, are uh, I don't know, devoid of a, of a facet that we could bear, uh, uh, very well, you know, call magic? You know, I mean, so I don't know. Maybe, maybe uh, it's this, this the typical problem I have with, uh, uh, in the quote-unquote paranormal field. You know, there's uh, there's this uh, uh, wi- will to try to divide things or either or or you know. But <laughs> you know, in my experience, most of the time in the paranormal field, things are you know uh, both and you know yes. so maybe mm-hmm. Sasquatch is both flesh and blood and paranormal at the same time, in a manner that we simply cannot explain at the moment because ju- we just don't understand it. Well, it's it's part of the reason that I love your uh, Schrodinger's uh, cryptid <laughs> statement. <laughs> That's a great way to put it. Hmm. All right. Um... So one of the things I, w- I was thinking of doing for the for this uh, show just I don't know, it struck me a couple of days ago. Uh, I wanted to talk about the concept of fear and why we're afraid of certain things. Like why do some things creep us out more than mm-hmm. other things? Um, I mean, there are perfectly rational reasons to be afraid of certain things. I mean, I don't think anyone's going to argue with that. I mean, there's survival no. instincts and stuff like that. But like... For instance, why does a ghost scare us? Especially if the ghost isn't actually doing anything frightening. Hmm. Yeah, it's subjective. True, but I mean, it's not like the ghost is coming up and saying, boo, someone sees just a person walk through a corridor. And they shouldn't True. be there. I mean, why, why, does that fright, why does that send a well, fear response? If you want to look at that, if you want to look at the fact, we'll take the paranormal, because you brought it up. Um... I think the reason why people are initially frightened by uh, an apparition would be the fact that one, it's something that you don't see normally in your everyday walk about life Two, uh, for the most part in this area of the world, uh, the concept of death is looked at as there has to be another side mm. And then you have the idea of this shouldn't be here because we are told that you go one of three places. You either go to heaven, hell, or you exist in purgatory. So for this disembodied creature to be wandering around in front of us, that should that automatically sends off buzzers and alarms to the theological part of our, our upbringing, of our yeah. mind. Existential dread, right? Yeah, exactly. That's the best way to describe it because we're... I know how I was raised as a child. I was told that there is no heaven, there is no hell. You lay in the ground, and then at some point after this big war, 
if you died, you will be brought back to life and you live on Earth, which is the basic idea of what the Jehovah's Witnesses believe. Mm. Now, mm. I thought that was bunk from the, the word go. And that's probably one of the reasons why I was excommunicated from the religion, among other things. But uh, my father... When he was young, he was a Catholic, so he saw a lot of strange things. The house that he lived in was, for lack of a better term, was haunted, hmm. and he saw things growing up, and when he got older and he was no longer a Catholic and had joined the Jehovah's Witness faith, all of those things that he saw as a child and as a young adult, even you know his adolescence growing up, he wrote them all off as he was seeing things because this can't exist. But I'll tell you what, if you, if that same thing popped up in front of him now, he'd, he'd be frightened. I know he would because he's been with me at times in the past where strange things have happened and he turns white as a sheet. And for a, a darker skinned Puerto Rican to turn white as sheet, he's scared. <laughs> <laughs> so the idea there's a lot that goes into what causes fear. Like I'm not particularly frightened of anything supernatural or anything paranormal for a lot of different reasons now, but there are things that freak me out. Like flying insects scare the hell out of me. Mm. It's a phobia. <laughs> That's yeah. a whole different bracket of fear. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, pho phobias are more of a, <laughs> It's not quite the same thing. Like, when we look at uh, accounts of black-eyed children, people are far more freaked out by black-eyed children than they would be, say, a black-eyed adult. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because children aren't supposed to be dead behind the eyes. That's why. They're supposed to come from a place of purity, of being untouched, being pure, you know, being... Children are always looked at, well, I don't want to say always looked at because that's a blanket statement, but they're usually looked at closer to God, closer to a mm. pure state of things. I personally am not terrified of the concept of black-eyed children. I've told Tim, I've told Roe, I've told Greg Bishop, I bring them, have them come to my door. I want to see one. <laughs> I've never seen one before. I have three children. It's going to take a hell of a lot to scare me. <laughs> and, and I do think sometimes, though, with the, the people who actually encounter some of this stuff, there's there's a fear reaction that's not mental. It might be saying in the environment, um, you know, uh, there, there's the, the one graveyard I've been in many times where things have happened. There's one spot where you can feel this sense of oppression, like something doesn't want you there. It doesn't always happen, but when it does, it's very, very strong. And it sets you on edge. It sets off that fear response, even though there's nothing actually happening at the time. So it could be that when these black-eyed children appear, they're, they're emanating something that's setting off, you know, some kind of ELF frequency or something that's setting off your your fear receptors interesting yeah it usually yeah, a very visceral response from people something that we mentioned too early before we before we started recording was this idea that you know we we are supposed to have or you could argue we do have emotions ingrained in us to protect children to think fondly of children to yeah, want to yeah. you know to nurture children and when those are turned on their head by something frightening about a child, it's almost as if we seem more vulnerable because we are trying to be open. We are, we're trying to open up our compassion to them, and that is being used as an opening in our armor to, you know, to, to actually attack us. Mm. Yeah, also because the the natural order of things are upended. That 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 the which is uh, supposed to inspire a, a sense of protection. Uh, suddenly becomes frightening, you know, and threatening to our existence. And and coming to the the idea of the of the black eyed uh, children, uh, what I've heard on numerous accounts is this idea that uh, the people who encounter them, they feel that I mean, their words their words are that they feel feel that their soul is being threatened, you know. So. This is uh, uh, taking the, the, the concept of self-preservation to uh, an extreme that seems to go beyond the physical. 
Mm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and and to circle back around before we leave the ghost thing, like I think that there is, I think part of it is are the things that Lobo mentioned too, but I think also um, there is there is a pretty mundane component as well. I mean, my wife, I know that my wife is in the other room. She could walk in here right now and scare the bejesus out of me, just by tapping <laughs> me on the shoulder at the right moment. So I mean, there's something about like if if you're not <laughs> something about just something being unexpected that'll frighten you too. Obviously, yeah, definitely. And when you have that, when you have that unexpected component, yeah, when you have an unexpected component coupled with the fact that this shouldn't exist, I think that sort of amplifies it. Fair enough. I uh, have any of you watched? Um, oh, what's it called? I know the the subtitle is Candle Cove. It's uh, Channel Zero. Channel Zero. Mm-hmm. Have no, it? I have not. Um, mm-hmm. I would definitely recommend it. It's basically a short series. It's six episodes on sci-fi, I believe. Um, and it's based off stories from Creepypasta. Yeah, and the original Creepypasta story is actually pretty darn good. It's got a nice little... It's The format is really cool because it's all told through uh, uh, forum postings. Mm. So it's, it's, sort, of, it's sort, of like, you know, sort of like the way Dracula was told in, in correspondence. Um, mm. And it's a really cool way to, to have told the story. And I recommend anybody looking up the original short story because it's great. But I, I've heard good things about the adaptation as well. Well, the, and the thing about it is in this adaptation, you have these kids who are being sort of brainwashed. And, you know, they're they're attacking and killing people who normally would be able to overpower them. But what do you do when a small child attacks you, even with deadly force? Our, our instincts are not to attack a child. You kill it. You kill it with <laughs> fire. <laughs> Okay, uh, other than Lobo, uh, most people... <laughs> but I, I, I mean, Like I said, I have three children. You kill it with fire. <laughs> depends, depends on how old they are. If they're like middle school age or old, older, you just drop kick them, you know. That's true. Yeah. First of all, if you're being overpowered by a child, hit the gym. Well, it was... <laughs> but, so, so what they have is knives and stuff in the, in the show, and they're attacking various adults. And usually mm. kind of sneakily, like the adults don't realize there's something wrong, and suddenly they're surrounded by kids with knives and other sharp objects. So it's Children of the Corn meets Gage. Meets what? Gage from uh, Pet Cemetery. Oh. Mm. Mm. Hmm. I definitely That's would... terrifying. <laughs> it's, it's definitely worth a watch for anyone who hasn't seen it. It's done very well, and it's, uh, it definitely has a massive creep factor, and it's very original. You know, cool. men- mentioning children, children of the corn. You know, this uh, uh, brings uh, back uh, to me the idea of how adults feel so threatened with uh, children who are gifted with a high IQ. Mm. You know, you know, parents who don't really know how to deal with their child. You know, if they happen to be, you know, smarter than them, you know, and. and uh, it is it, it is something quite uh, upsetting, I guess. You know, you know, to find a child that deep down you know that uh, he's smarter than you, that he is probably aware of things that you don't even comprehend. You know, and that goes back to the idea, you know, of the upsetting of the natural order of things. You know, adults should be, you know, on, on, on a regular basis smarter than children, but you find a, ch- a child that is smarter than you, you know, or is that in somehow threat more threatening than you, that's obviously incredibly creepy, you know, that's probably the appeal of the uh, black eye black eye children, you know, mythos. That's an excellent point. Yeah. Mm. And the, and the thing is when you get kids that are that smart, they don't have the life experience to back up that intelligence and it tends to really right. really cause some issues. Oh Cause, yeah, because they know they're smart, but you know, without that life experience to kind of temper it, they they just think I can do whatever I want. I know what I'm doing. I'm smart. Mm-hmm. They get cocky. Yeah, and understandably, a cocky kid is never a good thing. Well, <laughs> and also they might not have a you know a defined or a refined moral compass. True. Well, they definitely you know, don't I... have a moral compass at all. Their <laughs> yeah, brain exactly. hasn't developed far enough along the lines for them to have that. <laughs> yeah. 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 So think of maybe some kind of non-human intelligence to that see humans being that cocky, smart child, you know, hmm. and they see sure it they as do. a threat. <laughs> yeah, and maybe that's why they're so interested in us. 
Watch the arrivals in theater. Watch the arrival in theaters oh, now. I can't wait to watch that. No, I can't either. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, looks so good. Definitely looks like one of the highlight movies of this year. Mm-hmm. I've I've been hearing it's one of the best sci-fi movies of the decade. Hmm. Wow. Yeah, um, and Hornaday from- was on uh, the Tony Kornheiser show today, and she was pumping it. And she's not really a big sci-fi fan. Yeah, my my uh, my favorite movie site tends to be pretty cynical, and they're gushing over it. So. Either that means it's an art flick or it's actually really good, so we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> well, you figure that you got that and the new Star Wars movie both coming out in a short period of time. Yeah, right? Ooh, yeah. I just wish Stranger Things would get up and start going again. They, 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 ha- they did start uh, casting the new season and putting it together. Oh, I can't Ooh. wait for that. Oh, great. So, um, so the other aspect of fear, like I was saying, with the... Uh, possible elf waves. I mean, I know there there has been research done that certain frequencies bring out a fear reaction in us. Yeah, and was it below 5 hertz? Something like that, yeah. Yep. And the question would be, why? How is that a uh, survival mechanism? Uh, good question. Well, I mean, if you think about it, the, uh, the larger animals, uh, elephants use mm-hmm. the lower frequencies. I know that bull elephants will use frequencies as low as is it five I think it's five kilohertz to be able to transfer information back and forth between other elephants. If you were caught in between that as a still developing primate, you'd probably know real quick that after watching, you know, Throg get smashed by this great big thing tumbling through, right after you heard that noise, you'd probably associate those low frequencies to fear. Well, that, you know, is, is a completely different direction than I thought you were going in, uh, Lobo, because you were saying that, uh, you know, when you're talking about elephants, I thought you were going to go into how elephants uh, tend to move to higher ground whenever they detect a tsunami. So maybe there's some sort of part mm. of ourselves that can use mm. these sort of these sort of uh, intuitive reactions to detect changes in our environment that we've just fallen out of touch with. Yeah, we've fallen out of touch with a lot of stuff. Mm-hmm. True, Yeah. true. Okay. And, and taking it back to Bigfoot there, I, I know I had at least one person on the show who had a Bigfoot encounter. It turned into a whole like hour and a half show with him. And one of the things he said is he sat in his tent and just had this overwhelming sense of fear. And then he could hear them outside of him and or outside of the tent and stuff. But he said the fear thing seemed unconnected to the fact that he could hear someone walking outside of his tent. It was just something that really, you know, it's like it was, they were like vibrating energy at him almost. Yeah, you know what? That was brought up as a theory as to what happened at Dyatlov Pass as well. well yeah, the yeah. subsonic, yeah. yes. And I don't know how valid that is, but it's it's definitely uh, worth you know a look. Sure, why not? I mean, that thing's just a, a big open mystery, really. And being and being yeah. from the Soviet Union, it's so hard to know. You know, we think our yeah, government's exactly. secretive. You know what, how yeah. much how much of what we're looking at from that story is actually true? I'm gonna say probably seventy five percent of it's not. Yeah. So, at least the official record. And how I do mean, you, they close that up pretty well? And how do you piece together the parts that are true and make any sense out of them? True. I mean, it's it's so far gone at this point, unless you know, somebody comes forward with other information. Sure. You know, I was um, trying to catch up with um, the Mysterious Universe podcast uh, list, and I was listening to this uh, story that apparently uh, broke a few months ago about this family uh, of uh, well-to-do farmers that mm-hmm. suddenly went to go on a on a weird, crazy-ass road trip. You know, the whole family, even you know the children who are who were adults. And it was crazy because they were all, you know, in some kind of trance, and and the, and the father is apparently is still missing, and there apparently is no answers of of why they reacted that way. Apparently, they left their home in a rush. They left their cell phones, their wallets. You know, it was almost on a an self-preservation instinct. Huh. So, you know, I mean, we don't have to look to the Diatlov Pass incident, you know, to find uh, a, a incidents in which, you know, people react in a very 
uh, strange uh, manner. Fair yeah. enough. And and you know, people like to connect it to the people in, in you know disappearances in parks and stuff like that. And I mean, maybe it is yeah, somehow connected. Yeah. Mm-hmm, I, mm-hmm. I think the worst part about that is be, we can't really trust the information because of the source. Of course. They could have, you know, it could have been a military mistake where they screwed up and went, we'll just make this look so weird nobody will know what to make of it. <laughs> yeah, but you know what? I have I have a hard time with that Why? explanation. It's Russia. They don't need to explain to anybody. Yeah, you know, I I've, mean, I've like, thought literally. of that before. <laughs> You know, Good point. Good point. I mean, they've they've <laughs> they've they've poisoned people. They've given people like uh, they make people disappear. I mean, yes. like literally disappear. If they if in my mind, my, granted, which is twisted most days. In my mind, if they were going to try and cover it up. Anybody that was involved in in the initial investigation would have been made go bye bye. Yeah. yeah, you know, none of the information would have been uh, brought forward at all. They would have just been missing people. Yep, that's a, that's a very good point. Yeah, mm. I guess we I mean, we just so much about it. It's just so weird. We 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 think of things in in the context of the West, where although yes, the government lies to us and twists things and spins things, they they. They pretend to have some accountability to us, and the True. Soviet the Soviet Union doesn't. No, they, and they don't need to. Right. <laughs> I mean, I s- they have Siberia. They have <laughs> Mongolia. They have. I mean, come on. Oh, you you want answers? Well, here's your answer. <laughs> yeah, we have a, we have a trip you need to go on. You're never going to be seen again. You have you have next two decades to think of answers to the question. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Uh, and there are definitely, I mean, Steph Young carry, covers some really bizarre disappearances. You've had her on uh, Project Archivist, right? Not yet. Not yet. Okay, Not I, know, yet. I know you were I talking about have having her on. She's a, she's a, she has some fascinating research, and and some of them are just. I mean, the Yellow Pass is weird, but some of the ones she's covered are even weirder than that. Mm. You know? Yeah, I mean? yeah, yeah. And you just I mean, sit- the stuff that you guys covered, well, when she was on, mm-hmm. that there was some stuff there that made me pause. <laughs> and and you get such anomalous phenomena in some of these areas that it just. Yeah. To me, it suggests that we just don't really know much about the world we live in, as much as no. we like to pretend we're safe and we understand it. Yeah, not only that, but that uh, also the realization that human beings are so easy to manipulate. Even people uh, with a very high level of intelligence. Yeah, well, that's true. Mm-hmm. I mean, when we're dealing with perception, we're 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 very limited in what we actually perceive, but we assume that we perceive everything that's there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's it, the um, thing. not even it, close. It reminded me of a great quote that Gordon White had on his last episode of Rune Soup, which was, um, we live in a magical world, but not all of us are magicians. And <laughs> it's a lot like, it's a lot Oof. like, we all have teeth, but only some of us are dentists. <laughs> so, like, yeah. whether or not you're a dentist or not, you still have to use your teeth, and your teeth are still a part of your life. You're embedded in this. It's part, it's, it's part of your reality. Yeah. yeah. It's an interesting way of putting it. Um, so, I mean, the fear thing also, of course, goes down to we don't understand something, so we're afraid of it. It, yep. doesn't, it doesn't fit into our paradigm, so we're afraid of it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. As and, a whole, yeah, I would yeah. agree with that. Um, and it's not, not everyone. You know, as you said, Lobo, paranormal stuff doesn't tend to scare you. It doesn't tend to scare me very often. Um, there's been a couple times where it sent chills down my spine. Oh, yeah, the chills are there, but I think that's a visceral response. I run towards it 99% of the time. <laughs> exactly, The other yeah. 1% of the time, I'm asleep. <laughs> mm. I, uh, I, I realize that the, the experiences that have always freaked me out the most are more related to things like um, sleep paralysis, like where I'm in that mm. altered state. Had some, that before. 
something happens, uh, you know, like like a one sleep paralysis thing. I thought I had woken up, and as I'm mm-hmm. laying there, a hand reaches up and grabs my leg through the bed. Mm-hmm. And oh, no. my reaction was to be really freaked out. Now, I don't think something like that would happen in real life, but if it did, I don't know that I would be as freaked out. It's that altered state where you're not quite the same you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or you're more of you. Mm? Ah, yeah. good question. Yeah. <laughs> Very good point. But I realize those are the things that freak me out more, is, is in those type of states. But maybe also because they have the dream imagery where you don't have so much control. You, you realize what's happening is saying that shouldn't happen. Yeah, mm. I've had a couple of those in my lifetime that are just, I still... One of them I'm thinking of right now, and it's it, I got I got the giblies just freaking <laughs> thinking about it because it was just it was completely out of left field, and it just should not have happened. Well, do 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 tell. Uh, I I talked about it before, not here, of course, this is the first time, but um, it happened on two different occasions, and it was both the same, for lack of a better term, creature. Um, I was laying in bed, and this was oh my skin's crawling already. Um, <laughs> It takes a lot for that to happen. But um I was laying in bed. This is before children. This is this is we were in another house that we were renting. And it was a two floor house. And uh I was in it was in the dream and uh I couldn't I couldn't move and it was it was like a it, it seemed like a scene out of like Scooby Doo. Like, it was misty, and the colors were vibrant, but it was moonlight. And um, I couldn't move in the dream. And this thing that, for lack of a better term, looked like a chick, like a baby, like a bird. Mm -hmm. Not like a, but but not a bird. It was a humanoid bird. And it was gray, and it had very large eyes. It still had a beak, but it was humanoid in form covered in feathers they were downy feathers and like not not completely simian feet but they weren't they weren't bird feet either and this thing just looked at me and it made this god-awful noise like almost a scream and at that point and i couldn't move and I woke up, and that thing was in my bedroom. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, okay, that, it's it's the dream. I'm, I'm in the middle of a dream, and it 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 was staring at me in the dream, and in life. And I could, it was there because I couldn't see the fish tank that was on the other side of it. Mm-hmm. Huh. So I, it was at some point it it was there. I, it, it it was there, and it turned and it ran out across the front of the bed out the door down the stairs and i'm like okay good it was just a dream and then i heard the front door slam (laughs) (laughs) okay so i got up and i'm like okay i'm following this thing come hell or high water i'm following this thing so i went downstairs and the front door was locked and closed what I heard was the screen door open and close. So whatever it was passed through the door but couldn't go through the aluminum screen door. <laughs> and that was the slam. So when I open up the door, I'm like, okay, the wind caught the door, and that's what was... No, that screen door was fastened tight, and it wasn't flapping. So I wow. went back to bed. I was like, forget this. I'm going back to bed. I mean, I went out into the yard. I was like, I've, I got to, I got to see. I went out in the yard. It was a bright full moon. It was probably about three o'clock in the morning. So I, I looked around. It wasn't nowhere to be seen. I didn't hear any receding footsteps. So I went back in the house. I went back to bed. Fast forward, I don't know, maybe a year. And I was sitting at work and I worked the graveyard shift at my shop. And. I for for whatever reason I heard I heard the door there's a there's a fire door that never it never gets open you can't open it from the outside stairway it's locked from our in, inside and I heard that open and close and I was like oh Jimmy's here one of the guys who or Hody 
either I thought it was either Jimmy or Hody, the maintenance guys and one of the guys that owns the building. Sometimes they come through there, but I usually hear them walk through part of the other building first. So I got up and I went to go look, and there's that thing standing <laughs> not more than 25 feet from me. It saw me and it took off. Mm-hmm. And it took off and it went through a pass through and then it went into the back room. So I'm like, okay, game on. I got my Magnum. Whatever it is is dying. <laughs> I ran after it. I went into that room not thinking. And that back room has no entrance, no egress. The only way out of that room is through a three inch pipe that goes up through the ceiling and doesn't go anywhere. Huh. It, was, it wasn't even in that room when I got there. And I'm I'm talking I'm talking from me unholstering my shoulder holster to get to that point was no more than a second because I was hot after the thing. Hmm. But when I saw it that second time, I wasn't as frightened of it. I'm like, nope, nope, you're on my turf now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I wonder if things can bleed from the imaginal, not imaginary, but the imaginal realm into the re- the realm of reality and and if maybe sometimes we don't facilitate that by entering the imaginal realm in sleep that sort of sounds a little bit airy fairy but i hope my no not at all my my, the, my thought process is taken the veil between the two is very thin yeah mm-hmm. i agree i mean there's uh, these stories of alan moore the famous comic uh, book writer you know whom uh on a several occasions, he with uh, he met or he saw one of his characters, John Constantine. Oh you know, yeah. In real in real life. Mm-hmm. You know, and uh, at, at one point, you know, the character came uh, near him, you know, and whispered something, saying, you know, I'll tell you the secret of magic. You know, I, I don't remember the other part. You know, like any. Body, any motherfucker can do it. Something like that. Oh, I was the one who cursed. Now, <laughs> so, you know, I bet. How you about that, huh? <laughs> it wasn't me this time. That's yeah. all right. That's all right. But yeah, uh, I think uh, what you call covered that in. Uh, oh, what's his name? Um, that just wrote the book with Streber. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Jeff kind of, Thank you, Jeffrey, Jeffrey Kuiper. Kuiper. Yeah. Yeah, which which book was it? Was that in the um, Mystics book? Mutants, Mutants and Mystics. And Mystics? Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Yeah, that that is a creepy story. That's just mm-hmm. it, I've had. That's that's one that still when I tell it, it still makes this the hair on the back of my neck stand up. I've had a. I mean, I've had a a whole bunch of stuff that I just can't explain. That in involves something that would be considered flesh and blood but just isn't i can't i can't the way it behaves it can't be at some point it may be but as it transfers through i don't know so mm-hmm. that's why when that you know to go back around in full circle i can't say that the people that are seeing bigfoot aren't seeing something that's not a topa or something that's just beyond the veil of our reality or our waking reality right so mm-hmm. i can't say that it's not because of the situations that I've been through, mm-hmm. yeah. But again, I don't. I, yeah. I mean, the, the places where where it's being seen, there's a lot of power in in the great woods. There's a lot of power there. So, yeah, it could just uh, be a touchstone for our own our own um, imagination, our own wishes. Are you know the the other side of the the primal nature of what we are? Yeah, yeah. Um, That's an excellent point. Can I ask you something, Lobo? I mean, absolutely. Uh, you know, emulating you know the type of uh, research that our friend Mike Leland does, you know, in the paranormal field. Mm-hmm. I would like to ask you, what was your like state of mind? when you had these uh, disturbing episodes, you know, were you uh, uh, under a lot of stress in your life, personally, when you, when you had these experiences, were you, were, were, were you going through some kind of personal, you know, uh, turmoil of some kind? 
the, for the when when I first saw it, no, they, I didn't have a care in the world. There were no children. There was no nothing. Um, I misspoke when I said it was months. It was years later. Actually, I'm thinking about. It, I'm like night shift. I didn't start night shift until my last child, my second child was born. She's nine. Hmm. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, we're talking, we're talking all of, oh, it had to be 10 years or better between seeing it. Now, you got, you got but to no, wonder, it, so, so it, it kind of started as dream imagery and then turned into something you saw in physical waking life. Um, yeah. And you got to wonder if, like if you were out in the woods and somehow was exposed to the exact same energy, would you have seen Bigfoot? Uh, it's a good possibility. I've seen my guide before out in the woods. Like a spirit guide? Yep. Okay. Have you seen it anywhere other than the woods? Oh, my God, yeah. Absolutely. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. Actually, I spoke to uh, Linda Godfrey about it. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. Because it, it bears a striking resemblance to what people are seeing with her research. Which is what? And I've been a uh, dog man. <laughs> oh. Really? Oh, jeez. Lobo, Lobo, Lobo. All right, okay. Yeah, makes sense. <laughs> I've, yeah. Been, I've had a wolf in my life since I was very small. Hmm. And that hmm. did happen under distress. So before that, it was a toucan that would come and visit me. Did he say, follow your nose? I'm sorry, I had to. No, I never did. He spoke like he, any one of you people. <laughs> And when I tried to tell my mother about it, she told me I was crazy. And then after my grandfather killed himself, they switched positions. It went from the toucan to the wolf. Interesting. Or not really a wolf. I mean, it's not really a wolf. Wolves aren't eight, nine feet tall. That just doesn't happen. Right, right. (laughs) Prince Mononoke. So so, so what, what did Linda think about the similarity to the dog man? Uh, we had quite a, quite a nice conversation about it. The description that I gave her, I I had originally heard her speaking on Erie radio forever ago. And I called in after hearing her and told the guys that were running Erie radio about it. And they were supposed to get me in contact with her. And that just never, it never materialized. Mm Mm-hmm. So when I spoke to her about it, she's like, oh, I remember you. I remember listening to the show when you called in. I'm like, yeah, I wish I had talked to you back then. But the description, um, other than the experiences that are spoken of or the sightings that are spoken of, of the dog man, for lack of a better term, there is never any real interaction with humans. Really? Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's like like they don't talk to you. They don't. There's none of that. It's like grimacing is all you get, really. Pretty much, yeah. I this what I've what I've dealt with since I was four or five. Let me think. The bird was before. So before the bird, nine years old from the age of nine to I'm 41. Hmm. Although I haven't seen it in maybe five years now so and i've been off drugs and alcohol for 21 so there's that (laughs) hmm. has your life become more routine since then since the last time you saw it um um the last time i saw it was when my wife's grandfather passed and my life has gotten different from then i was working night shift i was watching children during the day now i i work during the day and watch children and i'm still not around humans very often other than small ones thus this the black eyed children thing doesn't frighten me because i'm always around kids Hmm. so i I don't know i don't i want to say routine i mean it tends to show up when i when i need it to for guidance. Okay. Hmm. Interesting. And I'm not the only one who's seen it. That's what made it even more terrifying at one point. 
because I went through a, a small portion of my life thinking I was completely insane. Mm-hmm. Sure. And I was with my wife, and we had been dating for maybe three months, and we were parked outside of my parents' house, and I was in the driver's seat, and she was in the passenger seat, and we had been talking. It was probably 11 o'clock at night, maybe 12 o'clock, and her face goes blank, and she looks past my head to the corner of my parents' house and then back at me and goes, what's with the big wolf? <laughs> And I just looked back, and I looked at it in the corner of the house, and I'm like, you can see that too? And she's like, yeah, it's been wandering around for quite a while. I didn't expect to see it at your parents' house. Hmm. I'm like, oh, all right, so I'm not crazy, or you're just as crazy as I am. <laughs> you're on the same qu- crazy wavelength. Yeah. Well, and even more interesting to me is there's been a recent, uh, recent series of call-ins to Mysterious Universe um, about... Um, people at a young age seeing wolves, large wolves outside their window. Yeah, Rogan yeah. has as well. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, what has uh, always fascinated me about uh, all these accounts that Linda Grot- Godfrey in, uh, investigates is uh, the idea that these entities seem so surprised that the witnesses can see them. You know. Mm. Almost as if they are accustomed to not be perceived by uh, the human inhabitants of these worlds, you know. And then all of a sudden, for some reason or other that we just cannot uh, uh, understand, you know, the witness can uh, perceive the sentence. It's almost, it's, it almost hints to the idea that uh, we inhabit a world that is kind of like an onion, you know, there's layers upon layers mm-hmm. of different, uh, I don't know, states of consciousness of states of being, and we just, you know, humans perceive just a very narrow bit of it on a, on a normal basis. And it's, and it's not even that we just perceive a narrow bit, it's that the narrow bit we do perceive is also kind of just uh, filtered down by our brain. We're not yeah. seeing everything we perceive. We're seeing everything our brain thinks that we should perceive. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's very true. I mean, you talk to, you talk to a, a, if anybody has ever spent time with a child, I mean, like a small child, not like, I want to say that the magic age is between three and five. Mm-hmm. If you sit down and talk to a child, their reality is what they see. Yeah. They have, it's they not have, until we're told we're not supposed to see these things that they yep. go away. Mm-hmm. And it's, 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 it's a breath of fresh air. Like one of my nephews right now is dealing with something that is freaking out his parents. And the first person they call is me. Hmm. And I told him, look, if you need help with it, I'll help you. I'll sit with him. We'll figure out what's going on. But you need to ask him. You need to ask him if Uncle Boo can see them, too. Mm-hmm. If he tells you that he can see them too, then we can move forward. If he says not, then chances are it may be a, an imaginary friend. Mm. Yeah. And when he sat down with them and said, "Can you, does Uncle Boo see this? It was answered in the affirmative, and I'm like, okay, well, then we can work with this. Hmm. But you haven't done anything yet. Um, I went and I held him for a little while, and we were talking. Now, he's two. Mm-hmm. So his his vocabulary isn't the greatest. Sure. Mm-hmm. But I can understand enough of what he's saying and get the idea of what he's trying to convey. And since that time, I brought him into the area where he was talking about this particular individual or character or whatever it was. And since I've brought him to that area, he doesn't seem to be having as much issue with the area. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if he feels safer that someone else is dealing with it with him or he's just come to grips with the fact that this is going to be something that's around. Yeah. The uh, And the thing, too, with kids, as we've said many times, when kids remember past lives, there's no filter there. They don't, yeah. you know, yeah. they're not thinking, well, I shouldn't remember this. That's nonsense. They say, no, this is what happened. Okay, now I'm going to go play. Yep. Mm-hmm. 
They're very sure. matter of fact about it. Sure, I mean, the world that uh, children inhabit is full of magic. You know, everything is magical. You know, when you're a child, because it's the first time you experience it, and it's only when you grow up yet that you, I don't know, grow cynical and then yeah, that the wonder is lost because it becomes, I don't know, routinary. And uh, I don't know, maybe that is the reason why children, you know, it's all, are also able to perceive things that we adults maybe, you know, just don't, it's not in our scope or in our radar anymore. Well, we've been told it's not there. Yeah, yeah. Over and over again, you know. Your imaginary friends are not real. No, no, it's, all, it's not only that. It's because we adults, we just don't pay attention. I mean, uh, let me tell you something that happened to me last week. You know, I was driving, uh, I was commuting to work, and I uh, tend to drive very early in the morning, you know, it's like uh, around 7 a.m., and I was, uh, it was a very clear day, you know, very, very beautiful morning, you know, and the sun was just coming, coming up, you know, rising up, and I just looked to my left, you know, to one of uh, a very characteristic, very uh, uh, staple uh, buildings in Mexico City, you know, the World Trade Center, and I saw the World Trade Center being uh, lighted beautifully by, by the morning sun, but at the left of the sun, I saw this streak of light, you know, that I considered it was some kind of like meteor or bullet, you know, that mm -hmm. was like almost like falling into the city. You know, I was like, oh my God, what is this? You know, trying to look it, you know, without, you know, crashing my car, you know, <laughs> and it was just the only one there. Obviously, I couldn't like stop because it's like... It's a, a speed highway, mm. and it wouldn't have made that much sense, you know, because if you take a picture with your cell phone, you know, it's not like the best uh, image you can get. But the thing that struck me the most is that I was trying to find that day and the next day if there was some kind of like uh, uh, notice of your news of. of other people seeing this thing, you know, in the city. Right. And there was none, uh, no other mention of it in the news. I mean, a city of 20 million people, and uh, apparently I was the only one who saw this thing. <laughs> yeah, you, you, know? you think Jaime would be all over that, you know? <laughs> yeah, but that tells you something about, you know, we people don't pay attention. You know, it almost seems like only children and weirdos are only, you know, realizing what's going on in the world. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder if psychedelics and meditation aren't just deprogramming us, you know? Exactly, if they aren't just exactly. defragging the hard drive. Yeah. Well, look, look Maybe at like the... ayahuasca? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, look at the guy that uh, Greg Bishop had on that saw the, the, the thing sitting by the highway, just sitting there, and that they didn't know if anyone else saw it, despite the fact that it was in plain view. Oh, the the, uh, the uh, motionless airplane. Yeah, that's what it was. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Just hovering in the sky. Yeah, it's a perfect example. I mean, pe people are so focused on what they're doing and where they're supposed to be or whatever's occupying their mind that they don't actually look around them. Not in an open enough way to pick up some of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And, of course, our world is so concentrated on being busy at all times. Because you have to be. Well, that's what I mean. You know, you're not given a break. Yeah, well, you know what I find? When we slow ourselves down and we actually pay attention to our surroundings, many things open up. Mm -hmm. Many things open up. Some frightening. <laughs> um, and that, that brings us back to fear. And I think as kids, we're less afraid of things a lot of times. We have to almost be taught to be afraid of some of this stuff. True, true. I heard a poltergeist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I knocked over an empty. I knocked over an empty Dr Pepper bottle. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, the uh, there was something else I was going to say about fear, but the Dr Pepper bottle has now distracted it out of me. I blame you, Josh. 
<laughs> no, dude, no, I, it was a poltergeist. <laughs> <laughs> but it was spawned from you. Um, Funny, so... he doesn't look like a uh, pre-adolescent female. <laughs> oh, um, no, no. <laughs> What so let, let let's let's do this. Let's go around. What kind of things do scare you guys? I was. Oh. It's it, no small secret that I was terrified of the abduction scenario. Really? Yeah. Right. Oh, absolutely. Like literally, like to the point where I remember one time, whatever was up with the. This was not too long ago. It was um, like back in like around 2011. Whatever was going on with the uh, positioning of the Earth and the and the and what was happening in the sky, for some reason, out one window, I could see Venus really well, and I freaked out. I was convinced <laughs> that this light was just waiting to take me that night. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, like that was the same night that like my cell phone was dying and it, and it made a beep that I'd never heard before, and I was convinced that there was some. Sort of, I was I was super paranoid. I was mm-hmm. terrified, and. Um, it's kind of funny, uh, you know, getting into all this was almost like a, a, a sort of a form of therapy for me to sort of get over the fear of that scenario. Um, I, uh, I, for whatever reason, the idea that, that consciousness plays a role in all this makes me have a little bit more comfort. I guess because it gives me a toehold into controlling the situation. Um, but, uh, you know, and some people would hear... So me say that and be like, oh, you must be an abductee. But like, I don't care. Like, again, it's that thing. Like, it's that thing of just something being unexpected, or like an intruder. Like that was the big thing. Like, I'd still have the mm-hmm. same feeling if some, if like, you know, I mean, heck, I love me, I love Miguel with all my heart. If Miguel showed up at the end of my bed, I'd probably hit him with a baseball bat in the middle of the night tonight. You know, <laughs> um, just because, just because it's just it's it's a place of vulnerability. It's something that you're not expecting. So I mean, like, yeah, exactly, hands yeah. down, hands down, the abduction scenario frightened me. But just the the home intruder idea is just a sort of a the home intruder while sleeping idea is something that 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 still gets me to this day. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's understandable. Yeah, that's, uh, home intruders, no, not here. Hmm. Yeah. What, a, what about you, Lobo? What 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 really freaks you out? Oh, like anything that freaks me out, or like oh, yeah, are we what, talking what, about a pr- particular parameters? No. What 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 gets that fear response from you? Things that fly at me. Anything that flies at you? No, which is strange. Like um, pigeons. Um, wrens, hmm. bees, moths, but ravens don't bother me. Uh, buzzards, crows, d- d- bats, none of that stuff bothers me, but like <laughs> bees, flies, like uh, you want to, you want to see a brother hit the ground quick that, that, that the hackles go up, eyes dilate, like, hmm. Like, mm. And I don't understand why either. That's the thing that bugs me the most. You said bees? Yeah, dude, like bees. Like, I'm allergic uh. to bees. I have an EpiPen with me. Well, well see, it's, that's... It's that's... But, no, but it's not just that. That This is... that The EpiPen is relatively recent. This has been going on for quite a while. No, same thing with wasps? Wasps, I'm allergic to. The bee, but, but, bumblebees but, but, but the don't fear, bother the fear, me. But the fear. So it's just, it's just honeybees or... Honeybees don't bother me. Wasps bother me. Oh, okay. Wasps. Mm. Okay. okay. But it, it's like weird stuff bothers me. Like it's it's not like like a moth, man. When was the last time a moth bit anybody? <laughs> yeah, that's odd. You know? Well, well unless think, unless you're a sweater, you know. Well, exactly. <laughs> I think it has to do with the movement. You know, the movement of insects is very. Very strange, almost alien, you know, when compared to the movement of uh, mammals or or bigger animals. So maybe that is the kind of thing that uh, triggers something. Yeah, why don't praying mantis bother me then? Mm-hmm. Oh, well, well, they're they're, they're slow. <laughs> okay, um, June bugs. Again, not quite the same same behavioral. It's just, it's just weird stuff, though. You know, like, weird I, stuff. I, I have a friend who's actually afraid of moths, and uh, I, I was really amused by this and, you know, talked to him about, like, why, why moths, you know? Why? But apparently he had a bat infestation at one point, 
and it really mm-hmm. freaked him out. And the bats would fly at his head, and he's like, the moths move like the bats move. That makes See, sense. But bats don't bother me though. Yeah, well, like but, I've had bats swoop at me, and they don't. It's whatever, dude. If you're gonna bite me, bite me. Just get it over with. And most bats aren't gonna bite you. True, but still, it's I don't. It's I can't. It's uh, I'm a rather rational thinker, and this is the part that bugs me the most because it's just a completely irrational thing. Hmm. Like I, like like, I've done. I've taken steps in my life to try and break it, like parakeets used to terrify me so i have parakeets <laughs> like they anything i'm telling you things that fly like you want to talk about like visceral response it's it's no joke it's like this this is coming at me and it i get the same reaction this is going to sound terrible i worked at a pet store and i told them do not put me in the bird room <laughs> the bird i'll work with the reptiles i'll work with the fish i'll work with literally everything do Boy. not put me in the bird room. Do you know how many parakeets I had to pay for <laughs> when I worked there? I mean, I mean seriously, oh like oh out of the God. air, swatted to the ground, and stomped like it was a demon. <laughs> it's just, and I, 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 so when I, you know, I, I've tried to use rational thought, and I've tried to use immersive therapy. So I got birds. Now I'm cool with parakeets. I have two of them. One passed away on its own. I didn't kill it. <laughs> <laughs> like, like I'll take, I'll take snow out of the cage and it'll sit on my shoulder or I'll play with him and I'll put him back and I'm fine with parakeets. Now I'll go outside and a crow will come flying through the yard or like the turkey vultures around here. No problem. No problem. But then like a, a Robin will come whipping through the yard and I'm done. I'm like, forget it. Oh, Hairs up, I'm looking to kill something. So so you're afraid of the harmless ones is what it comes yeah, down to. Yeah, which doesn't make sense, man. That one's not going to hurt me. Run. Well, that's the thing. And just recently, <laughs> within the last, was it last week, we had a moth come in the house. I'm like, I'm going to catch it. I'm going to catch it. I caught it, and I brought it outside, and I let it go. And I was fine. I was fine. But it's just, I don't, I can't explain it. And it bugs the crap out of me. That I can't explain it. Like I'm like, oh, did something happen to me when I was younger? No, this is relatively new. You know, within the last 15 years. Like I did I, when I was using. I got clean in '95. I was not afraid of anything when I got clean. All of a sudden, I'm clean, and I'm afraid of stuff that I was never afraid of before. Why? You know, did something happen to me by one of these harmless creatures when I was messed up and my subconscious remembers it? And it's just screwing with me, like, ha remember me? Maybe it was something subconscious that happened to you. Maybe. I mean, there was, I spent a lot of lot of days in blackout mode, trust me. Oh, okay, so to be fair, I kind of, I have, I have something similar to that. Like, I can, in terms of home pests, like, I can handle, um, I can handle any sort of insect. I cannot handle rodents at all. Because generally speaking, I can't kill them with a Kleenex. Um, really? <laughs> which is a you're big not, prerequisite. You're for not me. trying hard enough, man. <laughs> well, I I was at I was actually in an apartment complex um, not too long ago where a girl, um, the my next door neighbor, uh, woke up in the middle of the night and there was a rat on her pillow that had bitten her nose. Bam. Oh, wow. Wow. I can't, I, I can't imagine waking up to that. Again, maybe I it's just a variation on the bedroom intruder thing, right? Um, but that just something about rodents just sets me off. I can't handle that. But again, that that is a rational fear that a, a rodent could be in your bed and bite you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. Ain't a whole lot of moths coming drinking your blood, are they? <laughs> no, no. Miguel, what's your thing? What's your thing, buddy? Oh, my God. I mean, where do I start? It will be easier to <laughs> list the things that don't scare me. I mean, I almost feel that my cowardice is the force, the, the driving force of my life. <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, sure, I, I share Joshua's uh, fear uh, of the abduction scenario, you know, I've, I've suffered numerous epi- episodes of sleep paralysis. Uh, they always terrify me, you know. The, 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 I guess it's the 
it's the experience of loss of control. You know, I mean, you lose mm. basically control of your the most uh, your most precious possession, which is your own body. You know, you you lose possession of your body. You know, you are you're no longer a human being. You know, you you know you are you know I don't know what you are. You know, you're just a hapless consciousness. And what else? I mean. Uh, obviously, I, I I live in a in a uh, developing country where where there's a lot of violence. You know, there's a lot of crime. So obviously, that scares me. I've been I've been uh, uh, mocked on several occasions. You know, and uh, and the possibility of uh, being uh, you know assaulted or even being killed is something very real that I have to live on on a daily basis, you know. And <laughs> recent developments obviously makes make me afraid of the future, you know, uncertainty. Yeah, probably the other thing that triggers fear in most humans, probably adults, right? You know, because children are careless, you know. Children live in the eternal now, you know, I mean uh, 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 a time of, uh, some kind of a time experience in which you know the summer can life uh, can last a lifetime, but adults here you know our our years you know they 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 go by so fast you know and faster and faster, so obviously that triggers the fear of uncertainty for the future, you know and you know you fear for anything you know you you find. You find a, a weird lump in your back that wasn't there the other day before, and say, "Oh my God, is this cancer or some or just a cyst?" <laughs> I don't know. So uh, uh, there's so many there are so many things that can trigger uh, the fear response in your life, you know. And uh, I guess. Uh, uh, the trick is to try to control it, you know, I mean, it's like, uh, remember you guys, that, that, that scene in the movie Dune, when, you know, Paul Atreides is asked to put his, uh, his hand on the box, you know, that's, that's like the, the Gom Jabbar test, you know, and try to resist the pain, you know, of, of putting the hand inside of the box. And I feel that that is the thing, you know. Fear, fear is a base reaction. It's a primal reaction, you know. Trying to live without fear, you know, will be the ultimate accomplishment, you know. And I, uh, you know, live without fear. It, it's something that apparently people who go through the near-death experience manage to accomplish. You know, I mean, you go through that, you know, the, the rest of your life is a piece of cake. Apparently, so I don't know. I mean, it's something well, I would love to experience. Well, I, I would say most of your fears, Miguel, are pretty grounded. Like they're they're <laughs> logical, understandable things to have a fear of. Not like moths. Yes. Right. Well, for not... real. <laughs> for real. <laughs> well, now, I'm, now... I'm also afraid of mice and rats. So. Yeah, I'm with you on that, man. But but again, mice and rats can hurt you. They can bite you. They can carry diseases. There, there's some rationale behind that fear. Um, mm -hmm. Lobo, you had a near-death experience. Did it change the way you experience life, uh, what you're afraid of? No. No, not at all? No. <laughs> I did. No. <laughs> it didn't. Uh... That was a dead-end question. <laughs> well, it's, it's just, I don't, before, before it happened, um, I was very cynical about um, life and death in general. Mm -hmm. uh, afterwards, it's only gotten worse. <laughs> All oh, right. My God. There's, there's no. I. It's... Was it a negative experience? No, it wasn't a negative experience. No, it wasn't. It was. It was an interesting experience. Well, I can't say that it was negative or positive. It was. It had um, shades of both to it. 
Hmm. Is it is it something you can get into, or is it saying that we need like a full show to get into? Well, Roe, I think we recorded it. I want to say it was two episodes. Oh, okay. So we'll do that as a separate show at some point. It then. was. It was. It, it was an interesting experience to say the least. I'll tell you what. There was no Jesus. There was no baby Jesus. There was no light at the end of a tunnel. I didn't see any of my relatives. There was none of that. Yeah, well, not not everyone has that experience. So, yeah. And from having Shirley Black on, a lot of the people researching this stuff don't want people to know that's not part of all the experiences. They don't want people knowing there are negative experiences or that experiences that stand out from the norm. Yeah. Yeah, I won't say that I don't think about it every single day because I do. I I replay the entire episode nearly every single day mm. and it's just oh, it poses more questions than it has answers do you ever doubt the experience absolutely not mm. absolutely not do i think it it may have just been all chemical reaction within my brain at times mm. do i doubt that it happened no because even if it's chemical reactions going on inside the brain, we don't even know where consciousness comes from. Right. So, I mean, at that point, it's a, it's a moot point at that. Yeah. yeah if, at if, least if, in my experience. Well, one could say that what's going on inside our brain is reality. Yeah, absolutely. So I think what goes on inside our brain is more real than what we perceive every day. Yeah. Because hmm. if, if, if you really want to think about it, the way we perceive the world is through our eyes. All our eyes are connections to our brain. Our brain is sorting out light. Yeah. yeah. It's all it's doing. <laughs> and it's putting pieces together because of patterns that we understand. Yep. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's why I think sometimes when people come across some of this, this, these, I think what might, people might be coming across is energy their brain doesn't know how to process. So it just says, monster. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You know, or, or it says, that must be a Bigfoot, because that's something I've never encountered anything like before. Yeah, yeah, and I suspect that it's, again, this is sort of uh, touching on some other things, but I suspect that it's probably context-dependent, too. Not only your own personal context, but the context in which you see it. You know? Yes. So you encounter something in a forest. You're probably going to throw out ghost. You're probably going to throw out UFO slash alien. But you might you might latch on to Dogman. You might latch on to Sasquatch. You might latch on to you know, not not da not downplaying your experience with your spirit guide Lobo. Um, but uh, you know, and by the same token, if you're in an old abandoned house, you're probably not going to latch on to Alien. You're probably not going to latch on to Sasquatch. You might very well latch on to Ghost and, you know, graft that on there. I, I like the term you used in your book, uh, <laughs> wilderness poltergeists. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man. I, 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 it's getting harder and harder for me to entertain these things as separate phenomena. It's getting really hard for me. The, the 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 every day that I go down this path, it's seeming more and more like uh, like we're looking at multiple sides of the same thing. Mm -hmm. It's it, it's it's one actor playing a bunch of different roles. Yeah, that's one way to put it. Yeah, uh, I think that was Paul Kimball's concept: is that that it's it's literally one intelligence popping in with different masks on. Not outside the realm of possibility. No, mm -hmm. no, not at all. I mean, how would we know? You know? We we take the things we perceive and we hold them to be self-evidently true. If you see something that looks like a spaceship, well, it makes sense to us that aliens could be coming to visit us, so it must be a spaceship. Or you have an abduction experience, and they tell you, we come from Zeta Reticuli. So you come back, and you say, they came from Zeta Reticuli. Why would you doubt it? Why would they tell you that if they didn't come from Zeta Reticuli? Yeah, I mean, well, I don't know. I, yeah. I, I, I like the term that uh, Jacques Vallée used where he said they use sort of a meta logic. It, it's trying mm. to, to dis, disconnect your way of thinking so that you can think in ways you normally wouldn't. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I think the example he used is like you would walk around the corner and you bump into someone and the person says, do you know what time it is? And you check your watch and you go, it's one thirty, and they go, no, it's four o'clock and they walk off. And that's kind of what this phenomena does to us. Yeah, so it's interesting because uh, I remember how uh, uh, Greg Bishop and um, oh God, I lost, forgot the name of the these gentlemen who passed away last year. Uh, so they, they do they anything, do anything, yeah. Bruce Dwensing. Yeah. Ah, thank you so much. Yes. Josh. So Bruce Dwensing and Josh and, and and Greg discussed the idea of. Uh, Fear as a carrier wave. Hmm. The idea that, uh, you know, maybe the phenomenon elicits this uh, fear, not because they want to, you know, like feed upon our fear, you know, some, as some kind of like a, a psychic vampire, you know, that's, as someone like Nick Redfern have, have suggested, but hmm. maybe because... They want us. They want us to go to a different uh, state of consciousness, you know. Because when you are afraid, your your I don't know your defenses are lowered. You know the the the, the typical the typical defenses that you are always like having. You know when you go about your business in a daily, on a daily basis. You know you you go on a street. You know, and you're always, you know, <clears throat> when you're an adult, you're always like, mo like checking your surroundings, you know, in, in case there's some kind of funny business. But if there's something quite unexpected that you are not prepared to encounter, like, for example, I don't know, all of a sudden a clown appears, you know, like, you know, a rattling some kind of horn or something, and that's something t totally unexpected. Not, not only you're afraid, but your barriers are lowered, and maybe in that state of mind, uh, there's some kind of like uh, dissolution of your preconceptions that is required for you to acquire uh, new new knowledge, and that's mm. the that's the way I, f I, I fear the, I feel about the phenomenon. You know, Jacques Vallée talked about it as some kind of like a, a cultural thermostat, mm. whereas I see it as a chaotic catalyst, you know, that tries to like steer the pot to try to come up with uh, new ways of thinking and try to, to prepare the ground for uh, new paradigms. Yeah, that's that's an excellent point. And, you know, it's it's been proven that theta and beta wave uh, activity in the brain changes during intense fear. And if we can measure that using devices, using non-invasive devices, mm -hmm. then it stands to reason that something else could at least detect those same things through a non-invasive method and perhaps even find some sort of application for them. Earlier, either, you know, either a natural adaptation or a, or a technological one. Sorry, go ahead. That's okay. Um, earlier when I mentioned the, the spot in the graveyard that gives you that sense of, of foreboding, to me that's always been a gift because that's I, – I, I don't feel that it was actually what it felt like. I feel like it's a way to teach you to deal with your fear because there's nothing there to be afraid of. Mm -hmm. And so you know, it's one of those things where you say, okay, I have this feeling that I should run. Instead, I'm going to walk through the area that's giving me that feeling slowly mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and to see how much control you can have over your own, you know, your own reactions to these things. And sometimes when I've done that, the feeling just goes away. It just dissipates. Yeah, mm -hmm. always do that. Huh? That's really always do that. Right. Exactly. So so chicken and the egg do intense events impact upon a geographical area or do or geographical location or do certain geographical locations have this sort of energy that causes intense um, intense phenomena intense events to happen there you know our window areas uh, do UFOs Sasquatch and ghosts congregate around window areas or 
do window areas uh are, in, in other words in other words are things are are things coming to the area or is the area producing certain things i guess is the real question mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. maybe a little of both <laughs> i was going to say a little bit from column a a little bit from column b I think the pen- yeah well Again, that theme of, of trying to be non you know non binary about these answers that's a really good point. Mm-hmm. The uh, and it could be that certain phenomena create areas like that. I mean, it could be completely environmental in some cases. Uh, some place like Sedona or the uh, Skinwalker Ranch or something like that that seems to have weird energy could be just a natural effect from the earth in some way or some some effect of our reality with another reality we don't understand um or we could have certain very strong powerful events that take place in certain places that then make those places powerful you know they 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 have they open a doorway somewhere and make it into one of those places yeah it could be some kind of a uh, artificial construct, you know. Who knows if if the the site where the first atomic bomb test became, you know, all of a sudden a window area, you know? Yeah. Right. Which would be sort of like a technological way of of maybe thinning a barrier. Yeah. Well. Not not one we should try. <laughs> but again, but again, like. I, I, I would. I wonder if perhaps you could go back and see that you know either on purpose or, uh, or completely quote unquote coincidentally, atomic bomb sites were chosen because they were window areas. You know, either sure. either some sort mm. of arcane force drawing them there, or you know, um, in a very deliberate way, you know, being chosen for some sort of ritual significance. Well, that, that, that's just something that I'm, I'm constantly wondering is, is which side of the equation we're seeing. And like you said, it's probably a little bit of a mix. Mm. The, and the, uh, the thing I've noticed is that the, the graveyards that I've found to have activity in them are generally the older ones, which makes me wonder, was this graveyard put here because it was a sacred spot? Whereas nowadays, we don't go, okay, we need to put a new graveyard in. Where's our best sacred spot? We go, where do we have land we don't need? Yeah, ex- exactly. That's 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 part of what made me think about this, Sarai, because I know that you've mentioned that before. And I don't know if that's the case, but it just makes me wonder because it's only certain graveyards I've experienced stuff in. Other graveyards I've hung out at and gotten nothing, ever. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it has to do with the geographical location, personally. Yeah, yeah I... I don't think I don't think that honestly this might be a little bit controversial to some people, but I don't think that dead bodies in the ground is is as strong a governing force in terms of creating a vibe for an area as people would like to think. Mm-hmm. Probably true. I mean, if you're dead, you know, you you have reports of all these people haunting their their places of life. Why would they be hanging out at a graveyard? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Exactly, and and that's sort of sort of reinforced by the fact that you hear about a lot of UFO sightings have happened in graveyards. Very yeah. common, to, very common to see Sasquatch sightings in graveyards as well. Really? Um, yeah, yeah. In fact, I would probably mm. say it's more common than people seeing UFOs in graveyards. Um, so again, that sort of reinforces the idea that there's something about these areas that are chosen. You know, churches are chosen on on existing sacred land. And that's where you happen to have a graveyard, or cemeteries are placed on existing sacred land. A sacred, in some point, in terms of being mystic. Right. Mm-hmm. See, now, the town that I live in was founded in 1670. So our town is 100 years older than the country itself, mm-hmm. as far as being formed. Mm-hmm. We have a graveyard that was part of the original plot that was given to the original families by the king of England. Jeez. Uh, wow. Not a whole lot goes on in that cemetery at all. We do have a witch buried there, but mm. or someone who was claimed to have been a witch, which I find, considering my station in life, to be kind of upsetting that they still consider her to be a witch, but that's a different story altogether. But I will tell you that the other side of town where I grew up on that one of the original families that was given property in the center of town decided to strike out, didn't care what the king said, and built a house and a farm on the other side of town before anybody else left the center of town. 
and there's some weird stuff that happens there. Yeah. Really weird stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Have any examples? Uh, my 79 Oldsmobile used to die while driving on certain roads. And I figured, oh, it's just the, it's just the Oldsmobile. Uh, except my 84 Buick did that. My 91 Sentra did that. My 2000 uh, uh, Ultima did that. I mean, it, and it wasn't just my car. It, it radio, the radio would go out on, other, on cars. Um, you'd see on one particular road, you'd be going down, you'd see another car coming straight at you because it, it was a single lane road. You had to get over into the dirt in order for another car to come. And the car would be coming barreling at you, and the lights would get right up to you, and then there'd be no crash, and then there'd be no lights behind you either. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Sounds of horses, uh, sound of dogs when there's no, like, not normal dogs. And I, and I wonder what happened on that piece of land that might have caused it, or if it was just a natural location to draw that type of stuff in. Could be. It could be an echo of the past as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what I'm saying. Like, is it is it something in a specific area that's recording these events, or did something really powerful happen there that then turned it into an area that was picking up this stuff? It could be both. It could be. There, there's so many factors we don't understand about how our world works, how the reality around us works. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll tell you what. The last day of me using, I went down to that area and tried to take my own life. Mm. I was drawn to that area. Mm. Evidently, it didn't work out. <laughs> well, maybe it but, did. Maybe you were drawn there because you weren't going to be able to be successful. Well, I'll tell you. I'll tell you this. Um, I went out on June 21st, 1995, and I sat on a rock, and the night before, the people that I was with had taken all the weapons out of my car, so there was nothing. I didn't have anything in my car, so I broke a Bud Ice bottle to slip my wrists, mm. and no matter how far and hard I, de I, I cut, I wouldn't bleed. It just wouldn't bleed. Now, in 95, in this area, it was, a, it was really dry in June. It had been it was like a dust bowl and as i was sitting on the rock i could smell rain all of a sudden and the smell of lilac and lavender or one or the other it was it, it's always a mingled smell to me mm -hmm. and something said get up clean yourself off and go and get help hmm. and mm -hmm. the voice that spoke was a voice that at, at once sounded familiar and at the same time was a voice i had never heard before and when I went to go and get help, the person that came, that I went to their house, the minute I was in their company, then I started bleeding. But I didn't bleed before then. Wow. Uh, and what does that smell tell you, Joshua? The, the rain smell? Yeah. Um, well, there's, the rain smell is associated with a couple of things. Um, I believe there's a compound that's released during uh, rain that's called, I think it's called petrochlor. Yep, um, that's from released. the bacteria. Yeah. And... Um, but, I mean, is it possible that there was some sort of ozone quality to it, or was it, like, no. the rain? It was okay. It was the rain, and it was mingled with the smell of those two flowers, and lilacs are far, far past at that point. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, uh, I mean, I think that, for me, the thing that's more, uh, the thing that's more resonant with me is the floral smell. I mean, that's... A very common, uh, you know, Blessed Virgin Mary odor. It's a very common positive odor in spiritual disciplines and in uh, in in hauntings and such. The rain thing, you know, I don't, I don't know. I don't really don't know. Interesting. Well, I'm That's, glad something intervened. Something did. Yeah, jeez. Yeah, I mean, whether it be your higher self or something completely external to you. I'll tell you, I heard that voice again. Really? Yeah, two and a half years ago when I was in the hospital. Huh. Mm. What were you in the hospital for? Uh, Near-death experience. Oh. <laughs> I didn't, I, for some reason, I thought your near-death experience was related to your drug use. No, no, no. Oh, okay. And what did the voice tell you this time? No one leaves here. 
<laughs> well, that's comforting. Well, I got out, didn't I? <laughs> he met Earth. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Uh, I th- I, was it Streber who talks about that in uh, The Key, where they said saying like Earth is sort of a prison that we can't escape? That's a real Gnostic thing, isn't it, Miguel? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, what, yeah, but what, where I was was what he was telling me I would never leave. It wasn't Earth itself, believe me. <laughs> mm. <laughs> what What if the Earth, we're, we're like the Earth's food, and it's just digesting us, and it just keeps growing us and eating us? I saw that great meme. Maybe Trees. Was, right? Yeah, or maybe it was Lobo. <laughs> Trees are serial killers. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're growing us for our carbon dioxide and then eating our bodies when we die. <laughs> yep. Oh, that's <laughs> beautiful. It's apropos, isn't it? Uh, and and kind of true when you think about it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's, it's such a perfect symbiotic relationship. Yeah, we except need... we eat them. <laughs> well, they eat us eventually. And the things that we eat, eat them as well. <laughs> huh. All right. Um, and, you know, I'm asking you guys what you guys are afraid of, and I don't know there's a whole lot that scares me anymore. I used to be very... Credit card debt, right? <laughs> That's <laughs> crippling. I've I've eliminated a lot of that. Nice. Um, I used to be afraid of spiders. Mm. I'm still not overly fond of them, but at this point it's more like I don't want to get bit, uh, mm. especially since we tend to have wolf spiders. Yeah. And, mm. you know, they bite. So it's kind of like I, I just don't want to get bitten. It doesn't... You know, if I see something that's not a wolf spider, it doesn't tend to freak me out so much. I've actually held them in my hands and stuff like that just to deal with getting over it. Sure. Um, but I, I don't feel that that's really an irrational fear. I will sometimes jump if I see a snake. Uh, but again, it's more of a, I don't want to get bit. I kind of like snakes. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, I actually had a dream last week or so that at the end of the dream, I had gotten out of my car and there was a large snake crawling across the driveway and i said all right i'm just gonna wait and let that go and Mm. as soon as i thought that it kind of reared up shot out a hood like a cobra and latched onto my arm no cool and and i'm going and i i think i uh did i i think i grabbed it by the head and i was trying to control it and i'm thinking okay it's biting me it looks like a cobra what do i do now and like I, was pan- I wasn't panicking. I wasn't freaking out. I'm like, do they even have anti-cobra venom in this part of the world? Because yep. this isn't normal. <laughs> well, this was a dream? Yes. Okay, good. Yeah, I didn't really get bit by a snake. <laughs> yeah, well, the, the, the hood thing. That's, that's great. Not, yeah. was, was this a dream? No. I'm yeah. from beyond. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah. Well, no, no. And, just, I just, yeah. And in the dream, I'm thinking completely rationally about it. And I'm also thinking... How long does Cobra Venom take to work, and how deadly is it exactly? It's one of those necrotic venoms, right? Like, is is that one mm. of the kinds where your body starts to fall apart, or is it... No, is... that's rattlesnake. Okay. Mm. It's a neurotoxin, I believe. Yeah, it, like, cripples you or whatever pretty quickly, doesn't it? Yeah, people survive it, though. It's not like Black Mamba Venom. Mm. People do survive uh, Cobra Bites. It's oh, not recommended. Well... But. Sure, sure. I, I I believe I read a story about some some pop star in Malaysia who got bitten by a snake and kept performing until she died. Oh yeah, yeah, I yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, we always hear about those uh, the religious types that are handling snakes. Yeah, and sometimes get bit repeatedly and survive. Sometimes, yeah. But you know what? We had somebody on the show that told us about it. And? Who was it? They some of them milk the snakes ahead of time. Oh, so well, that that makes sense. It does. I mean, but still, you know, there's that chance of I don't. You know what? I couldn't think of better people to get bit by snakes. And yes, I said that out loud. <laughs> but you know what? Um, some of them obviously don't milk them because people have died from it. Oh yeah, absolutely. So whereas some may sure. I mean, it seems like a smart move. You're trying. You're trying to up faith. You're. You're. You know. It's a show. A lot of times. I can't remember who we were talking to though. Ah, oh, it's gonna kill me now. Maybe it was Joe. Was it Joe Nolan? Ah, oh, crap. Well, Joshua, do you, I don't know if you're the one who mentioned this or 
Oh, go ahead. Shoot, shoot. I got, I got something in my brain. I don't know where it came from, but it was the idea that a lot of, um, like, say, faith healers, witch doctors, shamans, stuff like that, will sometimes use trickery to convince someone uh, that they have power, thus actually giving them some power, some, you know, whether you want to call it placebo power or actual power, because some level of belief is required. Yeah, I think we, t- I think we talked about this. Um, it's almost like a sort of shock therapy. Yeah, or, or I was thinking more along the lines of sort of a fake it till you make it sort of magical practice thing. You know, mm. um, the idea that if if you act as if something has happened, it will happen. Like the way that uh, Crowley used to go out and eat caviar and drink champagne if he wanted money. Um, but also, I mean, like I, I, I'm 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 a big fan of. I mean, I'm a big fan of of really lounging in this gray area, you know, like maybe the contactees actually had something happen to them and they had to perpetuate that myth and it got out of control. Similarly, maybe these faith healers have to use hucksterism to actually get people to buy in on a consciousness level um, to, 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 to allow their body to, you know, to, to do the healing itself. And maybe a certain amount of belief is required before this stuff actually has any real effect. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Um. And speak. You know. And I. And I wanted to bring the, when we were dealing with fear. I wanted to bring this this idea up too, um, of the concept of cosmic horror that Lovecraft did so oh. well. Oh. Okay. Wheelhouse. <laughs> yeah, that's what I figured. Oh. Um. You know, and it's it's the idea that that we are insignificant compared to some things out there. Dude, the universe does not care about us at all. Right. It doesn't. I See, now, don't know now, if I agree. I wouldn't necessarily agree. I would think we are the universe. However, I love the, the cosmic horror aspect, not just from a horror standpoint, but from the just trying to imagine something so far beyond us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, my favorite Dark Yagath Lovecraft... on the rim. Right, right. Mm. You know, I mean, Lovecraft did a lot of good stories um, that didn't involve that cosmic horror, but they were never my favorites. No, I, you know what? I don't know. The Cats of Ulthar was kind of lacking. It was a good story, but, I mean, there was no real cosmic horror. No, no. You know, not like, you know, The Color Out of Space or you know, The Shunned House or... Um, no, Eric Zahn. Oh, I love that story. It's so good. I mean, yep, it's just... Yep. It's one of my favorites. I mean, rats yeah. in the walls. That's a. That is a. That's like the base. Like we suck. You know. <laughs> <laughs> um. But you know that that again becomes an understandable fear. That fear that we're insignificant. That fear that you know there's something so big out there it could squash us like an ant and not even care. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, in the grand scheme of things, is it really that far out of the realm of possibility? No, certainly not. And the fact that he tapped into that when he did, so far ahead of his time, so far ahead of the the general public being able to really grasp what he was talking about. True. I mean, but you had you had other writers before him that were doing it. True. That he, true. he tapped from. I mean, the Horla, the story of the Horla by Maupassant was a, a it was. It could have been a Lovecraft story. It was just this impending doom. It was another form of cosmic horror, hmm. you know. And you had, uh, I mean, to a lesser extent, uh, Dunsany. Dunsany's stories were more along the lines of, you know, at the end, God is looking out for you. You know, there was that whole idea, but it was still, it still tapped in, into a nerve. You know, and Poe, again, Poe had his stories. I mean, it was mostly the, the, just the, the nastiness of human, humanity in itself. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. He didn't I mean, do cosmic horror so much. No, no, he didn't, but he did touch on the, the darker side of humanity. Oh, absolutely. Which is, I mean, the cask of Amontillado is just, <laughs> I would love to wall someone up just for being a prick. You know, <laughs> I mean, in essence, the whole story is of revenge, and he did it just because the dude was a prick. Yeah, yeah. 
But it's a it's a different style of horror though. It's a different style. It do, that doesn't necessarily resonate fear. True. True. Well, but it just implies fear that's around you. You know, it could happen to anyone. Right. Right. Yeah. Being walled up alive is definitely not something I'd like to try. <laughs> no. There's, <laughs> there, there, there's still a level of human comprehensible order though in the post True. stories that you don't get in Lovecraft. You know, it's yeah. it's the same reason why conspiracy theories are so comforting is because it's comforting to believe that, you know, the system, no matter how big and corrupt it is, is still in control as opposed mm-hmm. to, hey, nobody knows what's going on. It's chaos, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, wait, nobody knows what's going on? Well... <laughs> I fall somewhere in the middle of that spectrum of belief. But. <laughs> mm-hmm. I fully believe that there are plenty of people who want to control what's going on and are more or less successful, depending on what we're talking about. Mm. I have no idea. Uh, do you, I, I, you know, I haven't heard you guys deal with conspiracies much on Project Archivist. Yeah, we 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 generally don't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It, it's There's, such a it, it's a rabbit hole type of a conversation a lot of times. Well, it's a rabbit hole, and halfway down, there's a giant pile of rabbit droppings, and then there's like <laughs> <laughs> yeah. every ten, every ten feet, there's this almost insurmountable pile of rabbit pellets. Gee, he, you're very that's very true. <laughs> I mean, it's not that it's not that Ro and I don't find certain conspiracy theories intriguing. Because we do. I mean, there are, there are ones that, that Ro and I kick back and forth. Because they seem feasible. On, on a, yeah. In a tertiary yeah. sense, they seem feasible. Mm-hmm. But when you get past that first layer, not so much. <laughs> I, mean, but we, I mean, we have covered certain... We did talk about the Flat Earthers. We, we, did, mm-hmm. we have discussed that. Um... Because, I mean, the reasoning is because why? I mean, why? It's round. Every other planet's round. Why would this not be? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, to, to me, right. the flat Earth thing is fascinating for the very fact that it shows a, uh, like, as, a, as an intellectual exercise, what do we actually know versus mm-hmm. what have we learned from other people? And we cannot, from what most of us anyway, some of us have been off the planet, have seen how it's a sphere and so on and so forth. But for those of us, like the, the I don't think the three of us or the four of us have ever been off planet um, that we know yeah. of. Not so, my physical body. <laughs> exactly. So, <laughs> I mean, we have to trust that what we're being told and what we're seeing is actually the truth. And if we go only by what we know, we can't necessarily prove the Earth is round. Mm. Well, with the exception of people who have personally flown continuously in one direction, you know. There's that. Oh, sure. sure. The people that didn't fall off the ocean on a cruise liner, you know, that. But what what I'm saying is from personal experience. Yeah, the boat I was on went over the horizon. We didn't go. Okay, well, there you go. So you're you're good. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty good on that fact. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm here, mostly. Mostly. Um, but, but yeah, you're right, Sarai. It's, it's, an interesting, uh, it's an interesting exercise in sort of the way that perception... Well, just, just how we perceive the world around us. Because, like, some of the anomal, quote-unquote anomalies that they point out are really interesting in a way. I'm not going to go so far as to say compelling, but they're interesting in the way that they seem to reinforce something that is likely untrue. But it's interesting to see the way that, that our person... Like, it's interesting to see the way that a case was easily built for a flat Earth prior to, you know, the modern conception that it is round. Yes. Yeah. I mean, as anything more than an exercise? No. All right. That's different. But as an exercise, it's interesting. It's an exercise in, in how we perceive and what we believe and why. Mm-hmm. Right. And plus, the Earth is flat, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I have an easier time understanding the rationale behind a hollow Earth. Oh, absolutely. Ideal. Absolutely. As opposed to a flat Earth. I'm not saying that either one really holds a whole lot of water when you get down to, like, 
basic facts. But there are there are tunnels, there are subterranean areas where people have lived. We mm-hmm. have proof of that. There are places all over the United States alone that have underground passageways. And, I mean, yes, <laughs> we just, you know, we have that. That is a possibility. People have dug down into the earth to find places of refuge, sure, to start sure. areas to live in. <clears throat> but, yeah, if... if- if you're saying, hey, the Earth is hollow, there's a black hole or another sun at the center, and there's a whole civilization living on the inside crust, okay, that's pushing it. Mm-hmm. But could there be even a civilization existing under the surface of the Earth that we're unaware of? It's not that crazy of an idea. And they discovered just within the last couple of years that there's a whole ocean that we didn't know about under the surface of the Earth. Well, sort of. It's not really an ocean as we know it. Right, right. But still, a lo- it's a large amount of water. Yes, it's trapped within sedimentary rock. That's the problem. Yeah. It's not an ocean as we know it. But it is a ton of water that, by all rights, we had no idea was there. We had theory that it was there because of the amount of water that should be here, as opposed to what is already on the surface. I mean, we have those so you- giant brine pools that are at the bottom of you know trenches that shouldn't be there. That are an ocean within an ocean. And what did they just find? A lake at the bottom of uh, the Gulf? Was it the Gulf of Mexico? Yeah, that's what I'm. Sp- that's what I'm talking about. It's a brine. Pool. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Was, all right. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, that's I crazy mean, course, stuff. Yeah, I mean, the, the news likes to kind of make it sound like it's more than it is. Always. Mm-hmm. Imagine that. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I. While it. While at the same time taking other stuff that really might have significance and trying to make it seem like it's less than it is. Absolutely. Yes. Mm-hmm. See, you know, because the election. It's crap. Well, <laughs> indeed. See WikiLeaks. How about that? Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, I uh, I think that, that, that the hollow earth thing holds some weight, not in terms of like the center of the earth is literally hollow and that there's an eggshell-like structure, <laughs> you know, not that sort of idea of like an inner sun or anything, but I think the hollow earth idea holds some weight simply because of the proliferation in folklore uh, of of just entities coming and existing from underground. Um, William Michael Mott did a nice book about uh, the the prevalence of underground entities in, in world folklore. And uh, I think that, I mean... It's it's a motif that re- reappears time and again. You know, Sasquatch lives underground. Fairy mounds are underground. You know, they're hidden hidden alien bases underground. Huh. Um, you know, that sort of <laughs> that sort of thing. Um, and but I think I think all that points to something. I mean, at the very least, it points to something that says a lot about us in a Jungian sort of way in terms of things inhabiting the subconscious, inhabiting the shadow self. Um, at the very least, if not having some sort of literal objective truth to it. Mm. And and it's not impossible to consider that there could be people living in extensive cave systems we haven't, you know, who maybe never come up. Well, you did have the, what were they, the green children? Yeah, well, that's a great, that's there's a, a great story. story. And no reason to doubt its veracity. I mean, despite its age, it it wasn't written. It, a wasn't written. It wasn't told in a time period where there was a lot of uh, nonsense being printed to sell mm-hmm. newspapers. And it's it's so weird and out there, and doesn't seem to have a point to have been a fake story. Well, and and and, and how mundane the entire uh, the entire affair ends. I mean, she just ends up living with people and ends up her skin her skin color returns to normal the sister i believe if that's correct yeah, yeah. Cause the brother yeah, cause... died right yeah. and all they would eat was green beans i mean right wasn't it yeah. or fruit yeah, or vegetables some... yeah yeah they would peel them with their fingernails i think they had really long fingernails that they would peel them apart uh and they lived in they had come from a land of perpetual twilight um, which sounds great i would i'm all on board for that I know. Yeah, Im- me Im- too. Imagine life. Imagine every waking moment being the golden hour of sunset. That would be so awesome. Yeah, <laughs> would love that. A lot, a lot of <laughs> photographers in the Greenlands 
uh, realm. A lot of photography. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, what I am fascinated by is the idea that the moon might be hollow. Now, not necessarily because there's anyone there, but its mass does not equal its size. You know, as a full structure, we have, you know, we've dropped stuff onto it. It's rung like a bell. It behaves mm -hmm. like a hollow object. In which case, you know, we already can't explain why it's there. Makes it even harder if it's hollow. As if it were towed into the perfect orbit to promote life on Earth. Yeah. yeah. That's no planet. <laughs> That's no moon. It's a space That's no station. no moon. <laughs> um, there, there, was, there was one... Uh, one scientist who said the best explanation for why the moon is where it is is that it's a co it's a collective hallucination. <laughs> Explain nice. that to the werewolves then. <laughs> but I mean, it's it, it's one of those things that that thoroughly fascinates me, and there may be a, you know a very mundane explanation to it, but who knows? I mean, a hollow moon is a really fascinating idea. Yeah, Wonder and what's we in know it, it has. It has to be at least somewhat hollow because it does again the mass doesn't doesn't match up and it has I, I think they have I think NASA actually has a map of like where the the um, the gravity and stuff is heavier as you circle the moon and like you said it also rings when struck yeah there was so, an explanation for the ringing though oh really yeah it was resonance because of the way the Oh, let me remember this right. Something about the makeup of the of the minerals. I wonder. Yes, it had yeah. to do with hmm. that. But now, was still. that just was that thrown out there, or was that actually a provable? It's hypothesis? it's it's a it's a theory. I don't I don't know okay. if it's a working theory. It's a theory. But again, it has to start somewhere. Sure, sure. And if I remember right, it was kind of like, wow, that made a big ringing noise when we hit it. Let's hit it harder. Yes, let's <laughs> launch. You know. Nuclear weapons at it because that's an idea. <laughs> well, if something this big made it ring that long, how can we make it ring longer? Yeah, right. it sounds like the kid with you know on the on the pond. Well, if I could skip yeah. this stone across, let's launch this rocket. Oh wait, we're covered in water now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've I, I've always thought when we look at ancient sites and stuff that we're kind of like kids just playing in something we don't understand. You know, like the, the way we kind of forced our way into the Great Pyramid. Yeah, like, or what we're doing to go begly Tepe right now. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But at least that's being preserved to some degree. We hope. <laughs> yeah. Mm. The uh but you know, like we, we literally blasted our way into the great into the Great Pyramid. Because that's what you did then, son. <laughs> <laughs> and it it just seems to me like it's a bunch of kids going, um well. How do we get in? Smash a door open. Get a bigger hammer. <laughs> but doesn't it's a lot of ways... The answer. That, that sounds like such a sexier time to be an archaeologist, though, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, you're, you know, just kind of root around. I've, I've got to get out my... i got to get out my paintbrush and dust off this... Uh, this the seal of Carna seal of the sarcophagus. Just gotta yeah, try to you know what? see if there's. Could you rem could you imagine Carnarvon saying anything like that? No, it'd be like, hey, it looks like there's a bloody bloody door on this too. Let's blow the. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Let's blow the sucker open. Let's blow the sucker open. <laughs> I think that was a part of a mummy. Who cares? Let's just burn them. Where's the gold? Uh, it is interesting that they're looking at new chambers in the Great Pyramid. Yeah. And, I, and I'm nothing but amused that Hiwas is just kind of blowing it off. No, no, no. There's nothing there. Yeah. Nothing to see here. <laughs> Not even in charge of it anymore. Still nothing to see there. <laughs> uh, which makes you think, you know, is he trying to hide something or is he just so stuck in his beliefs that... That's all he's ever going to believe. Probably stuck. Yeah. I think it's probably stuck. We know all there is to know. Go home now. Yeah. Nothing to see here. Sorry, the park's closed. <laughs> yeah, you can't help but wonder what he hid and suppressed and sold off. Like, what sort of things could have possibly blown the lid off of our understanding of, you know, the cultural narrative of Egypt that are just in the hands of some private collector or, 
you know, were deliberately suppressed uh, during his during his time. I mean, he's he's one of the people that I think he's someone who a lot of people aren't aware of who he is or his name, but has Hawass? I think has yeah Hawass. But I think in terms of like the the populace of the planet but has had, in his own way, in his own perverse, awful way, probably a greater impact on on our perception of Egyptian history than we will ever know because of what he's done. True. Hmm. True. Yeah, because, I mean, he didn't have to... He doesn't have to tell us what he's doing. Yeah. They could have found very fascinating stuff, and he could just be like, nope, that must be wrong. Bury it. Yeah, who can we sell it? Or who, can, who, who can we sell it to? Yeah, yeah. but at the same time, you know... Hawass was a uh, necessary evil, you know, as uh, the, the head of the, the Department of Antiquities in Egypt, he was in charge of trying to preserve uh, Egypt's uh, historical legacy, you know, and as a, as a citizen of Mex Mexico, I can understand that, you know, I mean, uh, I'm part of a country who was robbed of, yeah. uh, of That's our putting it lightly. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Holy I mean, cow. Take, for example, I mean, uh, there's still this um, fight between the government of Mexico and the government of Austria. You know, the, we, we, we've been demanding the, the return of uh, uh, Moctezuma's uh, uh, headdress. You know, that is in, in I think, the, the museum of, Aust uh, of um, Austria somewhere. You know, I mean, and they've been denying, you know, that the, the, our right to have this uh, historical heirloom returned, you know. And mm. uh, Hawass was, in a way, very successful in trying to, to preserve very important pieces from 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 escaping Egypt. You know, I mean, you have to. We have to keep in mind that for more than two centuries, uh, every European can could go to Egypt and just take whatever they wanted, you know, and, and, and with Hawass, you know, I mean, he has been trying to uh, have the bust of Nefertiti return to to Egypt, you know, and, 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 and uh, the museum in, uh, I think it's in Berlin, they, they have uh, kept denying, uh, kept denying the, 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 the the return of the uh, of, of this uh, effigy because they claim that it's so frail, so brittle that it couldn't possibly endure, you know, the trouble. So I don't know. I mean, I I sympathize obviously with you guys, you know, and in thinking that Hawass uh, has deterred and has been in uh, an obstacle in trying to, I don't know, get more answers about the the true history of Egypt but at the same time you know I uh, I can sympathize you know I mean Egypt has no oil you know they they their their major industry as far as I'm aware is uh, tourism you know yeah. so they leave off you know all these wonderful relics that their ancestors left thousands of years ago you know and the Europeans just, you know, they 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 felt entitled to rob them of that uh, richness for so many years. That so, you know, Hawass is the natural consequence of that. Anybody else seeing a pattern here? The Europeans took everything. <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, um. <laughs> All right. So I, I think this w road has wandered uh, far and wide tonight. Um, mm -hmm. That's one way to put it. <laughs> <laughs> so Lobo, tell people about Project Archivist. Oh, uh, it's Project Archivist. <laughs> All right. It's uh, I don't even know how to describe the show. It's me and Ro. We have guests on. We have authors on. We talk about stuff. Can find and it's not all—it's not all paranormal stuff either. Now we 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 tend to uh, try to steer clear of a lot of the normal fare, as far as paranormal is concerned. Mm -hmm. We try to touch on things that uh, we try to look at things a little differently. Um, and you have some pretty damn funny shows out there. We try, we try. We have uh, we have uh, the yearly fecal matter show coming up. 
<laughs> and wasn't that not supposed to be a weekly thing? Where did you guys just a weekly it thing? <laughs> I mean, it was it wasn't a, a yearly thing. It wasn't supposed to be an annual thing. That that uh, we had such an outcry after it was done the first time that uh, we'll be doing it again. Uh, mm-hmm. Chuck Brewer will be on with us for that one. He was on it the last time, and then uh, we have our uh, we'll be having our annual cannibalism show in. Uh, um, we do it during Thanksgiving because you know why not? Well, absolutely. <laughs> and we got some really good uh, we got some really good people lined up coming on this uh, this next week. Uh, tomorrow, tomorrow we're going to be having somebody on that I think is going to uh, be interesting to uh, quite a few of our listeners. And uh, cool, it's it's something that I've been looking at for years. It's something that Rose has been looking at for years. Mm-hmm. Uh, it has to do with uh, some. Some tiles that were left around with uh, strange messages on them. Oh. But, uh, oh, we're going to be talking, talking to about, somebody yeah. about that tomorrow night, uh, right around this time. Um, but yeah, you can find us at projectarchivist.com. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, <laughs> uh, Google Play. <laughs> And you just you just set up a whole new website, right? Yeah, we did. We're uh, we're now through Podbean. We uh, we left our uh, we left our carrier. We had to. We didn't have a choice. I'm sure Rose's gonna give me crap for saying that, but I don't care at this point. <laughs> <laughs> but um, Rose's done a lot of work behind the scenes. He's been he's been busting his rear end to uh, to really get this thing moving. You know, he, he's tough on himself a lot, but uh, dude, dude does the. Uh, he he pulls the plow, you know the guy. I'm mm. I'm I'm supposedly the guy that comes on and makes people laugh, but Ro uh, Ro pulls the plow, you know. He's uh, he works like hard on the ox. website. What's that? Like an ox. <laughs> he's a rather large individual. <laughs> no, no, I was just I was no, I was just I was giving him a hard time. We we love Ro. <clears throat> Ro Ro's a good man. He's a good man. He's uh, I'm honored mm-hmm. to call him brother. He's a good man. But uh, well, yeah, that's all I got. Well, I'm glad we finally got you to join us. Well, I'm honored to be on here. I thank you very much for the opportunity. And at some point, we'll have you back, and uh, we'll also have you back to talk about your near-death experience. Oh, won't that be fun? I'm dying yeah. to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, guys.